Dance of the Dragons is fully kicked off. Everything just feels like it's times 10. It's like we grew the town. Ryan said to me one time, it's much more Games of thrones -y. What am I allowed to say? <laughs> I've never eaten so much Manchego. It gets messy. It's good to be back in the saddle. to see everyone, nice to be back on set, to be aiming for something that's bigger and better. Feels good, you know. I work with such amazing and beautiful people. Oh, this is the best cast that I've worked with. We're all such a unit. I love them so much. Is this BTS? Yes. yes. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. First day back was like, that summer when you leave school and then you come back and all the boys have got like trousers that don't fit properly anymore and all the girls are like a foot taller. And just exactly like being in Harry Potter and it is your second year at school and you've got a better wand. It wasn't as if we'd been away really. It felt kind of like we'd had a couple of weeks off. It's like you never left. You know, it's like coming home. Because you walk and you go, yeah, this is my house. I know this place. Felt like a long time coming. It's been great to be back with the gang. This is genuinely my favourite cast I've ever worked with. The scale of season two has been above and beyond my expectations, at least. Everything about it is massive. It's like this room is massive. There's nothing in it that's small, apart from some nuanced acting, which is nice and small. Your imagination almost doesn't allow you to think a set could be as big. It's bigger, it's badder. Got more dragons. We've just taken it to a ten in every department. Dragon! Yeah, it's massive. We had two main units, so you're shooting two movies every day, all at the same time. Oh, it's very similar to a big film, but the fundamental difference is there are five directors. We made the slightly crazy but efficient choice to block shoot the entire season, which means we have two units shooting continuously five different directing teams, four different DPs, and that's how we started. And now we've got two units plus a splinter unit plus an elements unit, and sometimes units are splitting into two to accomplish more things. My brain would short out and I would just give up trying to grasp it all. It's huge, and it's just the level and the scale of the sets, the number of crew, the catering figures. There's no one unit that seems to be having an easy time of it. For me, it's script begat plan, begat schedule, begat budget. When you work that system and you have a collective, everybody is putting every minute of every day into improving that narrative. As a director, you're not quite sure what you're going to be handed, and you look for the things and find the things that you know are going to be personally satisfying. And I got to go back to Winterfell. I didn't really ask why, because I was so happy to do it that I, <laughs> I just went with it. Hearing that music and seeing Winterfell be revealed over the mountains and then going to the wall, it's hard not to get emotional, even as a salty old veteran like me. Walking on the wall, being surrounded by Starks, that was one of the best moments. It's such an iconic part of this whole world. We definitely wanted to be faithful to the look that had been established there, but there are differences as well, like the grade for House of the Dragon is quite different to the grade for Game of Thrones. But you still want the fans to get that little buzz of excitement as well that we get from shooting it again. We definitely did not want to reinvent the wheel with the wall and Winterfell. That was such a sort of fond memory for all the audience. We've tried to do justice to it and bring it back as they remember it. So it had to have that Game of Thrones look and we went back to see how they did it and get that feel as closely as we could. That was necessary to hold within the scriptures, if you like. Quite a part of that set actually is digital. So we'd done all of those drawings prior to shooting. The whole opening was really heavily previews. You know, it's a huge wall. 
you need to make sure that we kind of get a sense of that. We do have some assets that have been kept from Game of Thrones that we can work with, but of course you always develop on them. Visual effects moves quite quickly. There was the backlot set, which is up on top of the wall. It's so cleverly built that most of what we're seeing is just the sky until you go out on the kind of outlet pieces and then that becomes our world. It's a pretty contained set once we're in it from a dramatic point of view. You know, we're adding the northern view, which, you know, we all, we all love and fear. What does it keep out? Death. To get it right was important, so we used all the references that we could from the original build. We thought we'd try and give it what it deserved in giving it an icy feel to it, which we did with wax. It's amazing how much fake snow and stuff can really make you get in the mood for it. There was a couple of times where me and Tom, who plays Craig, and we're trying to do our lines and, you know, you just get a couple of snow up the nose because it's just snow everywhere. I wanted my snow to be a little bit whiter because their wall is older. So I wanted it to be newer. You have to stipulate, like, I want icicles. I want a bit there and a bit there. And you go down and tweak it during the day. And then we will dress it with, like, make it sparkly and all that kind of stuff. What we have on the van, there is a Crendel that's an agitator. So we put the product in there, the agitator kind of breaks it up and stuff first. We've got a water tank that pumps the water down to this nozzle here. Paper will come through then as well. Test the water. Good. We've got a 300 litre drum tank there as well that we use. So we'll probably use one or two of them depending on how big the dress is. The main changes really have been different people have moved into different spaces with the change of regime. There was a thinking in how we distribute those apartments. Obviously, when Helena became the queen, she would inherit the queen's apartments. When it was Alicent's reign, it was quite monastic and minimal to support her character. And now Helena, who is much more dreamlike and of the natural world, has actually scrawled what we could respectfully call graffiti on the walls to illustrate her thoughts, her thinking process, just as any writer or artist might make notes in a book or a sketchbook. Helena sees and perceives the world in a different way and cultivates different things out of day-to-day -day interaction than perhaps you and I would. She has graffitied her walls with her dreams and we think it really imbued the place with a great deal of character for her. Helena was fantastic. Her character was engaging. You know, the fact that her anxiety and her walls, the graffiti and graphics that sort of exposes the life that she's going through and her only way of escapism. I introduced these really beautiful cabinets, which I bought in India, actually. They were high up in this kind of like room that I wasn't allowed to go to, covered in dust and dirt, and the people were saying, you can't go up there. And I was like, I've spotted four of these cabinets. I want them. When you tilt them open, they're really pretty with all the lovely butterflies and insects. Just so many insects. I got to work with these crickets in these little wooden cages. They were making quite a few escapes, actually, which is quite fun. Just loads of embroidery, like so many spiders and owls and bats and kind of just creepy, cool Helena things. We had this dilemma, well, where do we place Alicent? And it seemed that there was a kind of nice irony that she would end up in Rhaenyra's apartment. Interesting, seeing as that's where Rhaenyra lost her virginity and then that's where she's having sex with Carl. They both had sex with Carl in the same room. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, sweet irony. It's all very, very messy. The Red Keep is a very incestuous place. The Princess Rhaenyra is brazen and relentless. A spider who stings and sucks her prey dry. We changed a little bit of the furniture, but we wanted it to be apparent. There was the constant memory of Rhaenyra being in this room. So we've kept the architecture and the position of furniture. In Dagon's apartment, we decided that that would pretty much stay the same. He wasn't the man who was interested in decoration or furniture, so he just moved in. Gone are all the histories and books, because Egon thinks he doesn't need that. Him wearing the crown is enough for him to rule. There is a new sheriff in town, and Egon's reign as king is very different than Viserys 
and the way that Viserys is obsessed about history and legacy is not something that is on Aegon's mind. My Grace. Good day. Because in the council chamber, most of the camera angles are looking towards the big window, looking out across the view. We ended up first season with a lot of visual effects, which obviously is very costly. So we decided to go a slightly old fashioned route and put a scenically painted backing in there by this brilliant artist called Steve Mitchell. And if you go right up close to it, it seems to be just a blur of splodges. And then when you step back to where the camera is, it just comes into focus as a view across King's Landing. It's a technique that's been used for many years and it's persuading people that it's still a good way to do a in-camera view out of a window. A lot of times in the series we're looking at maps as top shots looking down at the table and often because of that they don't get serviced in a way. We just thought it was interesting to see the map in a y-axis space versus an x-axis space. So it was just a more interesting visual way to dramatize the war and got people up and moving around a bit. Those council sessions can be challenging to shoot because everybody's sitting down, sipping wine. I was trying to pitch that the map that Otto Hightower brings in a small council chamber is something that sits on the table and is potentially being put together as like pieces of ivory. And the first time I showed it to Ryan, his initial reaction was, yes, I love it, but please, can you make it like World War II map? We've had our concept artist working on making it a standing up map. All of these areas of Westeros are going to be split into separate sets of ivory based on like the geographical elements of Westeros. They expect to march quickly, meeting little resistance until they reach the Riverlands. We just talked a little bit at the early days of design, had a little input, and then she did a beautiful job of evolving that and made it into the stunning piece that it is. It's an amazing bit of dressing. It's an amazing action prop is what it actually is. Biggest one that Ellie or I have been involved in. Logistically, there's a lot of times that it has to move and there's a lot of manpower involved in doing it. It was a lump. It was made for real and it was very heavy. The Red Keep had a 400% extension. The general consensus was from legacy players, the courtyard was small. The number of scenes season one didn't justify that scale of build, so this season we've been able to do it and it links directly into the King's Landing streets, which we had done digitally last year. And it's really given scale and depth to that run of street. One of the magical things about Jim's sets is that once you're on them, you can forget you're on a set. You can walk around for a good 10 minutes before you see a scaffolding tube. It makes it possible to do so much without mounting the incredible costs that come along with filming on location. So far we've done our King's Landing scenes in a beautiful medieval town in Spain called Catheris. The problem with shooting in beautiful cities like Caceres and Trujillo is these are world heritage sites, so you can throw horse crap and mud all over the street and set things on fire. If you want to do that kind of thing, you have to build your set. So what we did this year is we expanded our King's Landing backlot set. <laughs> it had been my ambition on this season to build part of King's Landing. So the point was to make it seamlessly connect to the real place. Hopefully we've done that with the look and the style. I told you bear in this light for the high towers. Fuck the high towers. The boldest thing that I think we did there was decide to give the last 10 minutes of the episode over to these two characters that we had never met before. And knowing that you're watching Game of Thrones and you don't know what is going to come from you from where, hopefully is the fun and the, and the horror for the audience that's yet to come. I was also given to understand that you possess a unique knowledge of the Red Keep. My ghost tunnels. Great big rat's nest it is. I know them better than the shape of my own cock. We have all these monumental sets we have. Dragonstone, we've got the Red Keep and we've got Driftmark. But the most intense reaction the crew had to a set was when we shot the sewer for Blood and Cheese. I'd never really thought about Magor's tunnels, but we had to explore them, we had to represent them. Jim Clay did the amazing job of building some mini sets and then sort of incorporating into the larger set of the Red Keep. It's always great to do a sewer for an art department. Mike Dawson put in the water and it was absolutely flowing like a mad river. 
The sewer is probably my favourite set. My easiest set, the prettiest set, I think. I know it's a sewer. We want to delay that first sewage dump, mate, just until they're slightly deeper in there. We didn't get much of a brief on that. They were just ploughing through the water, and I thought, I'm going to go to town on this. They're all madmen. It was incredible and kind of horrible. A medieval sewer, I can imagine better places to spend time. We were like, how are we going to build this tank effectively, quickly, portable? So we ended up buying these concrete blocks that slot together, and we built up a wall around it. We designed it so that we had big pumps on one end making a flow down through the canal. And then I put in tip tanks so it looks like people are flushing water down. And there was multiple layers, so you get like cascades. Then we opened it up for Malcolm to come in with all these guys and they built on top of it. We didn't have one single leak. Which is very unusual for any tank anywhere. They had some massive, fully functioning pumps in there turning the water around. It actually recycled water. They brought the tank in and then we built the set inside using the tunnel from season one. With the water and the way the special effects done their side of it, it looked fantastic. I remember turning it on for the first time and everything was working really, really good. And I thought, I'm going to get a gold star here. I called Alan up and said, would you like to come and see it? And he just walked in and he went, ooh. And that was good. And then the production office rang me up and they said, like, oh, can we come and see the sewer set? So he was turning it on for like a guided tour. I think we were taking more people in it than the Harry Potter tour at one point. I was really thrilled. We should be right here for the um, sewer entrance. Right. I mean, when they said you're in a sewer, I thought, OK, I'm going to be up to here in a swimming pool and there'll be green screens all around me and they'll get it done. And then I get there and they've built a sewer. The water's waist high, carrying a dog and a torch. It's like, we're in a hangar, 20 minutes from where I live. And here I am at the Red Key. Yeah, it's just, it's bonkers. OK, send me uh, water, please, Tommy. I think PJ was excited about doing these big spaces lit only by a torch. You know, we all watched The Third Man again, because anybody who shoots in the tunnel has to go back and watch The Third Man. It was great imagery, I think. That was a lot of fun. We got to chase these two guys, follow these two guys, lead these two guys through all these spaces, tramping through a sewer with running sewer water, and see parts of the Red Keep we'd never seen before. It's just a DP's dream. The design team on this have just surpassed themselves. We rarely double up on angles because of the opportunities this set gives us. Because their mission is about subterfuge, they're trying to be secret, but obviously the castle is dark and the space they're going through is dark, so they're carrying a torch. The interplay of the firelight bouncing off walls makes it really magical. I really wanted to lean into that, so we kept the lighting of the set itself to a bare minimum, so that as they move through spaces, you had a sense that you were moving through the space. You never had a sense that you knew where they were heading. You were discovering where they were going as they discovered it. In terms of getting into character, you don't really have to do very much. I don't have to say to myself, OK, you're in a castle, da -da -da -da. like all that's done. We need to get out of it and get out. <laughs> we had to just not think of it as like we're going in to film the most like horrifying thing. Another heartwarming moment from George R. R. Martin, everybody. This shot involved quite a lot of different methods of moving the camera. Going backwards at speed, up and down stairs, spinning around, trying to capture the performance from fear at the same time. Yeah, this certainly had its challenges. So, and by the time we come around, we want her to be that, legally that far away from this. Okay. So she's going faster and faster. So yes. when we come around, she's you know, we're seeing her head to toe there. She's she's getting she's going faster than us. Yes. And we want it to be believable that we come around here. She's that far away from us. Yeah. SFX did an amazing job making it look very atmospheric with all the rain and the wind inside the stage. We got ten thousand liters of water sitting outside, ready to pump into the stage. We have to make sure that the landing area for the water is sealed. We've got a membrane down, we've got some sort of management so we can get some pumps in. And then ultimately it just comes down to a lot of squeegees, a lot of labour and some pumps just pumping it out the door. It's a small piece of a large puzzle. I think it's going to look epic. That journey at the end of episode one, it's my hope that that kind of lives in infamy through House of the Dragon and its legacy.